it's a game of eight ball and I've got the three stripes and you've got the solid. Do you enjoy looking at shots like this? Well, I don't either. In this video, I'm gonna show you five chess moves that every eight ball player should know. And more specifically, I'm gonna show you how you can avoid shots like this. Hello, I'm Master Instructor Anthony Beether, and thanks for tuning in to another episode of Do You Wanna Play Like a Pro? This week, we're gonna be looking at five chess strategies every eight ball player should know. And the first strategy that we're gonna look at is the dreaded end rail. And if you recall earlier, I shot a very simple defensive shot and I put my opponent in all kinds of trouble because my opponent had left a ball on the end rail. The golden rule that I want you to understand today is when a ball is on the middle of the end rail, it's only easily pocketed from 12% of the table. If you break the pool table into sections, each section or each diamond is 12.5% of the pool table. And so, uh, as you can see here, uh, the one ball is not easily made in all portions of this 12.5% of the table. In fact, uh, there's just a triangular portion to where the cue ball can come to rest somewhere in here or over in here to pocket that ball. If you do the math, it winds up being roughly 6% of the table over here and 6% over here. Well, if a pocket's blocked, say for example, you've got the 12 ball over here, then all of a sudden, your percentage goes down tremendously. The ball's no longer pocketable from 12% of the table. It's now only pocketable from 6% of the table. So in other words, I can't play to this side anymore because that pocket's blocked. So this side goes away and now the ball is only pocketable if I get into this side and that's roughly 6%. So that's real important. Uh, in one of our previous lessons, I talked about playing percentages. And so I'm wanting you to understand here that anytime that a ball's on the end rail, the percentages are not in your favor. You know, even if both sides or both pockets are left wide open, is that roughly 78% of the time, I'm not going to have a shot on this ball. And anytime my opponent comes to the table and wants to play safe, he's probably going to get a pretty decent safe 78% of the time. Okay, my opponent just broke the balls and I've surveyed the table on both ends and I've decided that I like the solids just a little bit better than the stripes. So I want you to start looking for situations like this. So the first thing I wanna do is if I like the solids better than the stripes is for sure I wanna pocket one ball. But after I pocket a ball, I don't want to pocket another one unless I know I can run out. Because every time that I start removing a ball from the table, that's just like removing a soldier from the battlefield that you can use to your advantage in some way. So I don't like to run any balls other than the first ball unless I know I can run out. And when I say I know I can run out, I'm talking about at least a 70% chance that I can clear the table in that next inning. So. If I come to the table and I see something like this, the first thing I'm going to do is claim the solids because that's the balls that I like the best. Now, another thing I'm gonna be considering here is when I pocket the solids, how can I do something productive next? And so 
One thing that would be concerning me here is I've got a ball on the end rail. And as I've said before, balls on the end rail are only makeable from roughly 12% of the table. And so I know that's a percentage that's going against me. And so what can I do to alleviate the problem? You know, as I look at this layout, I know that my opponent cannot easily get out. He's got several clusters as well. He's got a cluster on the other end of the table. There's a cluster here. Chances are I'm going to get back to the table. But what I want to do here is this. I've got to decide, number one, how I'm going to remove this ball from the end rail. And so my first thing... My first option would be to pocket the three, slide over here, and then move the one to where that it's makeable from over 90% of the table. And then what I don't want to do is when I move the one over there, I don't want to leave it to where it's an easy combination for my opponent. I don't want to leave it in such a manner that he can easily shoot the 14 into the one pocket it and leave his ball in front of the pocket. But uh, these are some of the thoughts that I'm having during an eight ball game. So first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make the one over here. I'm gonna play my cue ball back over here because I see that he's got a 14 ball near the rail there that I can use to my advantage. I wouldn't wanna make the three and go over that way and shoot the one over here because there's no real advantage to that. If I roll a ball over here, I can possibly tie up his 14 while leaving my one ball free. Okay, so in this situation, our first mission is to pocket the three, claim the solids, and then what we're going to do is we're going to roll over just a little bit so we've got a shot on the one and we can nudge it over to block his 14. And we'll gain an advantage that way and we will alleviate the problem of having the one ball on the end rail where it only goes from 12% of the table. Now I've got two main missions here when I go to shoot the one. Number one, I don't want to leave him an easy combination where he can remove my uh, one ball and leave his ball in front of the pocket. And mission number two is this. I don't want to tie my ball up to where my ball won't go. So anytime that you move a ball from the, the, the end rail, those are the two things you should be looking out for. Okay. And you'll see I did that perfectly. Uh, you know, he can always try to make the combination, but in, in this instance, let me say this. It's not a dead combination to where that he can just shoot, stop, and leave his ball in front of the hole. If he plays the combination now, he's going to have to probably play it rail first, and guess what? His ball's going to be coming towards the end rail, and I might get an advantage out of that. But this is definitely the way that you would like to leave it. Uh, you know, if, if you leave it up a little bit closer like this, that's fine too. But the main thing is, is that I blocked his ball from going. And now, whether it be here or back here where I had it, my one ball is now makeable from over 90% of the table. And so that's a huge advantage in in-game situations. Because once all of these balls are gone, say we fight it out several balls later, and my one ball is the only one left, where do you want your one to be? Do you want it on the end rail where it only goes a small percentage of the time, or do you want it over in front of the pocket? And, uh, you know, even if he makes it or whatever, it's still better than me having this ball on the end rail that could wind up being a potential problem at the end of the game. Okay, I just want to reiterate that the strategies that we're discussing are strategies that are commonly used when you don't have a high percentage runout. 
maybe you've only got a 20 or 30 percent chance of getting out well then if you're in that type of situation you'll want to implement some of the strategies that we're talking about in this video and uh, one of the strategies uh, that i love to use in matches is the first shot nudge and uh, this is a perfect example of that my opponent has broken the balls i like the solids much better than the stripes and i've got an easy shot to claim the solids and so what i'm looking to do uh, with the first shot nudge is this i'm going to come up i'm going to claim the solids and at the same time I'm going to nudge the one over to where that his 14 ball no longer goes. So once I nudge that one in front of his ball, I've gained another advantage. And uh, at that point, you know, he's got a cluster up table. He's got two potential problem areas. Well, at this point, I can use the power play. If you've not watched my other video on the power play in eight ball, you should search for it and watch it, but I've got the power play here, and what I can do is this. I can alleviate uh, one of my problems without much consequence. You know, there's, there's not much chance of me losing the game because he can't make the 14 ball and he can't break up his cluster up table because there's nothing up there to alleviate the problem. And so what I can do here is if I've got two advantages like that, is I can alleviate a big problem here. And so what I would do is, uh, I would just break out my cluster there. And now all my balls go somewhere and he's still got this problem, this cluster and a cluster up table. And my chances of winning this game just skyrocketed all because I used the first shot nudge and and this believe it or not comes up over and over and over again you just have to look for it another strategy that i want you to begin embracing is don't be afraid to use your opponent's ball for defensive purposes several years ago i was playing in the finals of jr's eight ball tournament in uh, Lancaster, Kentucky. And uh, I was pitted against one of the top local players, Ronnie Lane. And uh, Ronnie came to the table and he had this shot. And uh, he had run down to the seven ball and tried to break it out. And he came up with a very difficult shot. And um, it was at that point that uh, Ronnie did something that I thought was really creative. And uh, in fact, what he did was this. Now notice uh, what's happening here. You'll note that in this situation here, he's frozen me to my own ball the seven ball is up close to the pocket. It's not on the end rail. It's readily pocketable from probably, you know, 80% of the table. And if I try to thin off the ball and go down table somewhere, he's still got the bank on the seven uh, to win the game. So I'm in a situation here where that, I can't win, but I can only lose. And he turned a no-win scenario into a fighting chance to win. And sometimes you can do that just by using your opponent's balls for defensive purposes. Okay, the strategy that I'm gonna show you now is called the old ball and a rail trick. And it's been around for years. You'll see a lot of the veteran players use this in eight ball games uh, whenever that, you know, they're down to one ball, their opponent has several balls left, their run out has gone awry, you know, uh, maybe they've ended up with a way that uh, they've got an off angle bank or uh, even making the bank 
Uh, in this situation, I still don't have a shot at the eight ball. So, you know, what's the purpose of shooting the ball in when I'm not going to have another shot to win the game? And so that's where the ball and a rail trick comes into play. It's really simple to execute, and it looks something like this. And tell your opponent you're calling a ball on a rail. You know, you're just going to tap the ball into the rail and let it tap right out in front of the cue ball. Just like that. Now note that I have blocked my opponent on all four of his balls and I bought myself another turn to the table to win the game because he's going to have to kick and there's a good chance that I'm going to have a makeable shot to pocket this ball and go for the win. This shot's another variation of the ball on a rail trick. And uh, this shot came up in a tournament 13 years ago. And I'll always remember it because I was perplexed with what to do. I was out in the middle of the table. I couldn't really reach the jump shot. And even if I made the jump shot, the eight ball was tied up and I was gonna have some serious problems. So the best bet for me was to try to buy myself another turn to the table. Let me see if I can demonstrate. And you'll see here, I blocked my opponent on all of his balls. I bought myself another turn to the table. And you know, 13 years ago, my opponent kicked at the four, he hit it, but he left me with the shot to where that I could pocket the nine and play position down here for the eight ball and that pocket for the win. So buying yourself another shot will in many instances give you a chance to win even when things look bleak. Another great strategy to use is called limit their options. And what I mean by that is limit your opponent's options by pocketing one of their balls. So here's a situation that I saw in a match where that Rafael Martinez was playing a local player by the name of Jack Howe. Rafael Martinez had got down to the two stripes and Jack had uh, cluster balls in the middle of the table and uh, what he did was he came to the table and he decided to call safe and uh, the reason that he called safe was because if uh, he executes this shot and one of his balls goes he doesn't want to have to shoot again and so he called the safety and then what he proceeded to do was shoot his four ball into Raphael's 15 and pocket it and then drive the cue ball into his cluster and break open his balls so whenever he returns to the table that he'll have a clear run out. And so let me see if I can demonstrate that. It looks something like this. Okay, now you'll see that uh, my opponents Hooked on his nine ball, the two ball precludes him from striking it. All my balls are uh, wide open. And uh, in this instance, when I return to the table, I figured to win, you know, because uh, my balls are laying so well that I should be able to pocket one of my balls and break open the cluster. It's really important in this situation to realize that the only way that my opponent would even have a chance of winning this game was if I left his ball on the table somewhere. You know, even if I leave it down here, if he wound up with a shot some way, he might drive the cue ball two rails and go into that cluster or three rails. You know, depending on what angle that he's got, the fact that he has another ball left on the table gives him a fighting chance of breaking open the cluster and winning the game. So my best chance is to pocket his ball and eliminate his options for breaking out the cluster. 
Okay, here's another variation of limit their options. This shot came up in the 2014 BCA Pool League National Championships. My opponent had five balls on this side of the table and one ball down here at this side. And uh, I had a situation where my ball would not go, but uh, I had to be very careful and not leave my opponent an option to shoot at one of his balls because if he gets an open shot, he has an excellent chance of running out and beating me. So let me show you what I did and uh, I hope you enjoyed the shot. You'll note in this shot that I pocketed his ball and I used spin to spin my cue ball to the long rail and back in behind the nine. My opponent's now hooked on all five of his balls. He's gonna to have to kick at them. I've got a ball laying next to the pocket that's pocketable from almost 90% of the table and the eight balls laying right beside of it. So I have an excellent chance to win this game and that's exactly what I did in 2014. Thanks again for tuning in to another episode of Do You Want to Play Like a Pro? I certainly hope this lesson has been useful to you. I hope that you've learned a lot from the five strategies we reviewed. If you have questions or comments, be sure to leave them in the section below. Don't forget to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's what keeps the content coming every single week. It's just one of those amazing classes that uh, you can never forget. It's one of those classes that can really get you going where you want to go with the game. It's the best online course on pool out there. It's been really cool working with Anthony from home. I've already learned so much. I love the course. It's easy to use and available 24-7, which fits well with my busy schedule. Luckily, I stumbled upon Anthony Bueller's online courses, so I signed up, and within three or four months, my game had improved dramatically. It will definitely improve your game. When I did go back to the regional tournament, finally after seven years, I got first place. They bumped me up to the next division, I went back the following year, I got first place in that division, the first year. I can't say highly enough how much Anthony's courses have helped me and I have no doubt they will help you too. If you do have any questions, he's available on the phone calls. He answers your questions very quickly. Uh, someone asked me about Anthony Biller's Virtual Beer Academy class. Go all the way.